as the first century of the Targaryen dynasty came to a close. Make it as sultry as you like, but narration is still narration, and this introduction has a lot of it. King Jaehaerys reigned over nearly 60 years of peace and prosperity. But was it really peace and prosperity? Or was it voluntary subservience accompanied by a chorus of, please sir, don't burn us to a crisp with your massive flappy fire lizards? Princess Rhaenys Targaryen, the king's eldest descendant, and her younger cousin, Prince Viserys Targaryen, the king's eldest male descendant. Only two character names and positions have been mentioned, and I already feel like I need a textbook to understand any of this. The only thing that could tear down the house of the dragon. Roll drag marshals. Sashay, oh wait a minute, that might be for another show. Was itself. Bum, 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 bum. Look, you all were doing it. Tell me you didn't and I'll call you all liars. And yes, I'm sending a show for not using the awesome theme from a completely different show that played over two minutes of credits that I could also send. Also, I actually like this as a subtle way to orient the audience as to when this is all happening, but it also means that the show's taken less than two and a half minutes to throw out a hefty name check from the main series, and that's always gonna get a sin. A saddle makes all kinds of sense, especially on a creature that flies at any height you wouldn't want to fall from. But seeing them here just reminds me that Daenerys never thought to do this and suffered no ill effects. And no, I will not promise to stop using this show as a way to resend the dumbest things in Game of Thrones. You know I don't like you to go flying while I'm in this condition. You don't like me to go flying while you're in any condition. Kids. They have massed on Bloodstone. Lord Corliss brings out this tiny map that no one else can possibly see, and even if they could, wouldn't give them any information other than basic geography they should already be aware of. I'd even love to say this was just for the audience's benefit, but it's barely unfurled before the shot changes, and is never to be seen again. They call him the Crab Feeder, due to his inventive methods of punishing his enemies. What an oddly specific and inconvenient way to punish your enemies. The cleaning and restocking of the tank alone would waste precious man hours that could be spent on orgy preparation instead. Or flaying. We have no way of predicting the sex of the child. Mr. Maester here has just talked about using f***ing moon charts to predict the day the child will be born, but hasn't got an equally bullshit based system for predicting the sex. And the odds of predicting that are basically 50-50. I mean, there's tons of scammers that would kill for a 50-50 shot at the facts. Like psychics, astrologers, or Fox News. There's a boy in the queen's belly. I know it. You do not, and you should not. And you're an idiot. Damon would be king of the Andals at TV sins. I bought you something. Also, characters speaking another language to each other randomly start speaking English. I guess Doctor Who's Universal Translator finally got sent down from the Death Star? Dragons are cool and all, but I'm more interested in the Targaryen jewelry technology that allows you to remove a necklace one-handed instead of needing 12 fingers, four broken fingernails, and eventually a pair of bolt cutters. Also, congratulations to House of the Dragon for setting a new record for waiting longer than 10 minutes before doing something that feels mildly incesty in a Game of Thrones property. I mean, never just about cake. Nor should you, Rhaenyra. Here are five cents for Alicent, assuming you would jest about cake. F***ing Alicent. Is it healing? It has grown slightly, Your Grace. David Cronenberg's House of the Dragon. It's a small cut from sitting the throne. I swear if King Viserys Targaryen, first of his name, King of the Andals, blah, 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 gets taken out by tetanus, I will laugh my ass off. Because of all the threats in Westeros, this feels like the most easily avoidable. Just get a new chair that's a little less stabby. You do understand that nothing will cause the bed to grow a c if it does not already possess one. This franchise's infatuation with the word c lives on in its first spinoff. This is the last time, Viserys. I just wanted to tell you so that when the pregnancy goes sideways, you'll have a good reason to pick the baby instead of me. Stealing your hype self routine from Mark Hanna. Beginning tonight, King's Landing will learn to fear the color gold. King's Landing goes on learning to fear the color gold for all the some time. Requiring your council to start each meeting by placing their balls on the table. You know how my brother makes sport of provoking you. Must you indulge him? Yes, it's clearly Dr. Kurt Cocking's fault that Damon decided to go to the recent dead wife blow. Nepotism much, King Viserys? The King's Landing has been in decline since my grandmother passed. That's a correlation versus causation fallacy, my good man. Just because Gotham has seen a rise in crime since Batman arrived, it doesn't mean we should blame Batman. And now I want to see a Batman series set in the Game of Thrones world. Well, assuming Discovery doesn't need another tax break and it suddenly disappears after it's complete. I don't look like this naked. Queen Emma has begun her labors. I don't care how well you project your voice, at least 25% of this crowd hasn't got a f***ing clue what they're applauding. I heard that Lady Eleanor is hiding a swollen belly beneath her dress. Gossip. Or kids. Gossip kids? 
XOXO. What do you know about the Sir Kristen Cole, Sam? I'm told Sir Kristen is common born son of Lord Dondarrion Stewart. Why is this conversation? Am I supposed to be getting hard because of another name check? Mm, let me check. Nope. And this show gives us three different shots of this distinctly yonic shaped arena from above as it intercuts the brutality of the games with the brutality of childbirth. It's a clearly intentional and powerful juxtaposition of the implicit and explicit violence of using women's reproductive roles as a battleground. And it's exactly this kind of shit that makes it impossible for me not to take a sin off of this show for working on a whole different level. Prince Damon is riding on a black horse, which was the equivalent of biting an apple back in the 100s. In other words, he's Damon Targaryen, first of his name, Prince of the Assholes. I can understand not wanting to cover Damon's subjectively beautiful features, but wouldn't their chances of retaining that beauty be greatly increased if he chose a helmet that actually protected them? <laughs> Scene does not contain a, you did this to me, you bastard. Just wait until I force a coconut out of your penis and see how you like it. During a difficult birth, it sometimes becomes necessary for the father to make an impossible choice. Super hard choice, but I respect him for choosing the love of his life. At least it looks like he made that decision. I mean, wait, 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 wait. what is happening? Oh my, no, no, that is not good. What the f*** is happening? Prince Damon Targaryen wishes to continue in a contest of arms. But he lost. What's the point of jousting in the first place if you can lose and switch to a game you're better at? This is like losing a ping pong and then switching to something you know you can win, like Kerplunk. But, you know, with a lower mortality rate. Premature smith abrasion. Also, cheap shots with maces. I'm not gonna apologize for not understanding the rules that haven't been explained to us, but why not kill him? Damon has a reputation for being a mighty brutal bastard, so Cole must know he'll come at him for revenge of some sort. Honestly, I'm amazed Cole even makes it out of this scene alive. Low talking to each other during a funeral. And your fucking mom's and fucking sister-in-law's funeral, no less. This dragon looks pretty miserable, but I can't tell if it's from the death of Ama or if it's just depressed that it's only being brought out for funerals and special occasions like it's the good family China. I'm sure the dragon isn't purposely going to flame on any of the bystanders, but I feel like I'd still be standing further back than these front rows are. No reason to test fate or a dragon's whims. Your Grace, this is the last thing any of us wish to discuss. It is not. These recent tragedies have left you without an obvious heir. I'm finding plenty to like in this Game of Thrones spinoff, and it very well could stand out on its own in this franchise. However, the brother of the king is next in line, but no one else likes the brother except for the king, but brother does something dumb enough that the king's friends are able to sway the king's favor, and he makes an enemy of his own brother. Cliché is tired. As much as I enjoy watching both Patty Considine and Matt Smith eat up scenery, I wish they had a conflict less generic to be involved in. What are you saying? My brother would murder me. Take my crown. Viserys Targaryen has survived nine years on the Iron Throne being this f***ing naive. I found myself thinking of your own mother today. Skip? How is his grace? Very low. I thought you might go to him, offer him comfort. Aww. Uh, ooh. Building a castle way too small to live in. What is this, a castle for incestuous ants? I thought I might come and look in on you, your grace. I brought a book. Bringing a book to cheer someone up. The king is so there once again. Isn't it great how his wife and newborn son were nice enough to die and make this possible for you? Laughing with your whores and your lick spittles! And all this time I thought lick spittle was a subgroup under the wider umbrella of sex worker that just had a more specific speciality. Instead of wasting time with moon chart bullshit, maybe somebody close to the king could do something useful, like filing down the damn iron throne, or at least the parts that are near his exposed bits. This is a ridiculous amount of overcandling, especially for an area that is hardly f***ing used. The only way this isn't a massive and unnecessary inconvenience is if this dragon's head is actually a novelty lighter that can light them all at once. And if that's the case, here's a sin for not showing it in action. Even more candles! The idea that we control the dragons is an illusion. If we don't mind our own histories, it would do the same to us. Sorry, Viserys, I'm almost certain that Rhaenyra won't have heard any of that lovely speech over the deafening sound of foreshadowing. I'm sorry, Rhaenyra. I have wasted the years since you were born. One thing for a son. But since there's not a chance of that happening, I suppose you'll have to do. We cool? Corsets or dresses that do little more than cut off a woman's circulation. Dragon saddle is one thing, but the Iron Throne is the most dangerous seat in the realm. He's not f***ing kidding. Warn her about the tetanus. Warn her about the tetanus! And just as Danis foresaw the end of Valyria, Aegon foresaw the end of the world of men. Just to begin with a terrible winter. Are you saying winter is coming? Because it sounds like what you really want to say is that winter is coming. Aegon saw absolute darkness riding on those winds. And whatever dwells within 
will destroy the world of the living. Damn it, people! After the 55 minute mark, I was positive we were getting through this entire episode without a previously on Game of Thrones. But you just couldn't hold your load, could you? Just had to wildfire it all over our collectively captivated maws when we least expected it. This secret, it's been passed from King to Ware since Egon's time. Now you must promise to carry it. This is a prophecy foretelling the end of the world and, crucially, how to potentially prevent it. And each king seems happy to rely on a spoken retelling and a promise to keep it alive. A promise? This would have turned into a game of telephones so quickly that I'm stunned Viserys isn't describing a one-eyed sky demon who can only be stopped when his favorite ring is cast into a big volcano. And three, two, one. I knew it! I could feel it coming. By the old gods and the new, why does every pilot seem to feel obligated in with the jarring as Fourth wall break. We get it. She's important. Oh sure, now you play the Game of Thrones musical goodness in the opening credits after I send the lack of it in the first episode. So now you're getting sent two more times. One for making me look like an asshole and two for making me wait an entire episode before I got my dun 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 fix. Here's what we know from the intro. Symbols bleed and run together all willy nilly until they fall into a hole that ends in a fire of a thousand suns and burns up. What we don't know is how bad the smell of burning blood must be. We go now to the aforementioned trouble in the Stepstones, with boots on the ground bringing terrible footage that will curl the toes of any foe. Speaking of boots, wear yours and triple tie those knots. The bloodlust crabs are back and we're not talking about trading kinky STDs during your cycle, princess. These crustaceans will crack your knuckles and carnivorously canoodle your caboodle until only your corpse remains. This update is sponsored by Joe's Crab Shack, confidently casting evil out of crustaceans for a truly demon-free delicious treat since the first men gave the finger to the children of the forest. Back to you, Ollie. His remains are being prepared by the Silent Sisters. The problem with the Silent Sisters being in charge of burial repair is that they never tell you when they're done, or when they've started, or what they need, because, well, because they're silent. All have passed fair trials. Ooh, like ring toss, high striker, milk bottle knockdown. Either way, winning fair games is impressive considering they're totally rigged. Four ships have now been lost. Did Corliss start speaking without placing his ball on the table? I thought the rule was expose your balls for all to see or keep your words under lock and key. The step tons have now grown into a conflagration, yet you sit here and dither about court business. Maybe the dithering wouldn't be so dire if Lord Corliss had simply said shit is on fire rather than inflate with a word like conflagration. And yes, I'm upset because I had to use the dictionary today. What reason does the crab feeder have to fear us? If you have access to a few thousand skillets and several pounds of butter, you could take away all of the crab feeder's weapons and feed your entire kingdom for weeks. You really need to start thinking outside of the box, Corliss. Damon has squatted there for over half a year. That's right. Six months have passed from episode one to episode two. And if you farted loudly enough during this scene, you'd have missed out on that detail entirely, making the remainder of this episode oddly detached. Not, not that I have personal experience with having missed such timeline clues early on. Sir Kristen Cole, son of the steward of the Lord of Blackhaven. We will find out shortly that Sir Harold and Otto don't want Sir Kristen selected. So my question is, why did they invite him to the rose ceremony in the first place? The Dragon Lords, the highest of the nobility, lived here the volcanic face, closest to the source of their magic and power. And here's a moment when I realize I would much rather be watching those Dragon Lord folks rather than these people. I mean, what makes these new characters interesting anyway? That Daenerys sprouted out of their ancestral insanity? I already went through therapy for that. Oh, the opening titles are leaking into the show. What if you went to her? There are times when I would rather face the Black Dread himself than mine own daughter of 15. Dads and daughters, am I right? But seriously, why is it easier to ask questions in a creepy manner to your daughter's very young friend than it is to ask your own daughter how she's doing? You do not mention our talks to Rhaenyra, do you? I fear that she wouldn't understand them. Why wouldn't your 15-year-old daughter understand that you have meetings with her best friend behind closed doors that have been going on since right after her mother died a little over six months ago? I'm sure she'll totally get it and be super happy when you take Allison as your next wife. This many candles, which appear to be concentrated entirely too much in certain areas, while simultaneously lacking a lit impact in the great void of this massive room. All at the same time. This entirely too long moment when Allison stares at Rhaenyra for nearly 10 seconds. I know tempers ran hot today. I wanted to assure you how much I value the bond between our houses. So much so, I'll tell you about it in private instead of in front of the council earlier, who mostly caused the tempers to run hot when they were quickly dismissive of you after you entered the room. You could not ask for a stronger match than Lena. And I'm sure this would work out for the king. I mean, it's not like Lena's a small child or even younger than Allison, right? Right? That is far too much food for two people. Oh, I know this game. It's a sound guessing game. Uh, is this sound bacon or rain? 
I've tricked you. This sounds maggots. Thank you, Game of Thrones, for ruining one of my favorite games for a f***ing lifetime. The maggots will remove the dead flesh and hopefully stop the advance of the rot. You know what would really help? A less stabby throne. All these unlit candles. And yes, I just send too many candles, but if you have them to light the room and do not use them during a medical procedure involving rotting flesh, then what the f*** are you even doing with candles at all? I, uh, dearly loved my own lady wife. As you can tell when I refer to her as my lady wife. I would give you many children of pure Valerian blood. Unless, of course, she isn't able to give birth for some medical reason or dies young or this is so f***ed up, right? What did your mother tell you? That I wouldn't have to bed you until I turn 14. Parents. The men of the realm already had their opportunity to appoint a ruling queen at the Great Council, and they denied it. They denied you, Princess Rhaenys. Love to see the Game of Thrones franchise has moved away from making petty jealousy be the focal point of 97% of the show's conflicts. Seems the realm wants for a new queen. Does the realm want a queen that changes her clothes when the day is new? Because Henrietta Hightower here is absolutely in the same dress she was in last night. I never wear the same clothes twice unless I just pity f someone and I don't want to leave until the mo Ew. I'm sure that she is good and kind. Well, and the good news is that if Lena's not, she can just be groomed like a piece of property to become whatever the old men want her to be. Am I Game of Throning right? I am. And that is a sin. I brought you something. Is it a new finger? Because he really needs one of those more than anything. Choreodrome on Damon Latas. All right, sweet, great. So I guess we know now that taking dragon eggs that were supposed to be for other people is a super quick way to upset a Targaryen. Does it have to make sense to me before now? Apparently not. I guess the upside to the shift in momentum is that we're watching something other than boring political conversation. Also, I get that everyone is upset and leaving the table quickly to deal with the dragon egg situation, but hold on, who puts their balls away? Can anyone handle their balls whenever they want? What are the ball rules? I'm very distracted by these men's balls. Deus Cyrex Machina. I conveniently built this bridge to be the perfect width for a dragon to rest both of its feet across. If you wish to be restored as heir, you'll need to kill me. Except the king will most likely remarry and have another kid, potentially a son as well, so Damon's kind of at a no-win crossroads. Even if he also killed the king, Damon would probably be killed before he ever planted either of Matt Smith's butt cheeks on the throne. Also, how many TV series are we going to have where the more evil brother is named Damon? I mean, there's this and Vampire Diaries and, uh, did I mention Vampire Diaries? Shoot, back myself into a corner here. Um, show steals character name and a trait from a CW show. <laughs> Nailed it. I came to you to be liberated. From what? Fear. Yeah, I'm sure. Maybe she fantasized that she could be liberated from fear after a wild night in the brothel, but in the light of day, certainly the very cunning Mysterio would realize that aligning herself with the very rebellious Damon would put her in harm's way with many things to fear. I'm saying she's hanging out with the Targaryen. What did she think was going to happen? I wish I had known better what to say to you in the aftermath. Poor guy. Hallmark wasn't around at this time, you see, so it was very hard to come up with a way to apologize for cutting open a person and ripping out a baby. That face when you've decided to derail your entire family's future and opt for a quick f rather than waiting for a strong ally that would prevent an internal war. I intend to marry the Lady Alicent Hightower. No one should be that surprised by this announcement. I'm more interested why people weren't asking why Alicent was at the council room with him in the first place. Seems like the king gave that announcement away by having her randomly in the room. This is an absurdity. Thinking not marrying a 12-year-old is an absurdity. When I ascended the Driftwood throne, I knew what I wanted, so I went out and seized it. Boasting about stealing. I've always thought of you and I as having been made from the same cloth. Holy sh**, he's talking to Damon! Is something no one had ever seen an episode of any television show exclaimed. You've heard of the troubles in the Stepstones? Yes, you've got lots and lots of trouble. I'm thinking of the crabs and the knickerbockers, bloodthirst crazed ones, peeking in the whore hall window after gruel. You got trouble, folks, right here in Free Cities. Trouble with a capital T and that rhymes with C and that stands for crabs. I will not have Driftmark beggared while our king idles himself with feasts and balls and tourneys. Balls! See? You know, they've done a really great job at highlighting the menace and terror of the Crab King and setting him up as a powerful villain in the Thrones universe. I can't wait to see how we get to know more about his motives and methods as he develops into the show's overarching nemesis for the next several seasons. Good thing he's not going anywhere. This opening Rue Bloodberg machine seems to be a metaphor about the halls running red from all the murders, but based on the season so far, I'm more inclined to think this is Dornish wine. You Prince Dreha, your whole mother and bastard. Father. Using his title of Prince in this context is confusingly respectful. Dragons kick all the ass, don't they? Which makes me wonder, why haven't they continued to send dragons after the crab feeder? In fact, why aren't dragons always the first line of defense? And there's a mention that he just hides in a cave or something, but he's gotta come out at some point, and if he doesn't, just let him starve in there. Dragons are easily their best weapon. Use the damn things before gets to this point, and maybe never gets to this point. 
here, my prince. Save me! Taking being a foot soldier to literally. Even with all the fire going on here, the visibility in this scene is so low that I'm having flashbacks to the long night. And anything that reminds me of the long night gets a sin. This mostly doesn't work because he is walking his dragon instead of flying it. And you have my nose. He does not have the king's nose. As we can see here, the king's nose is still firmly on his face. Jeez. It only remains for Viserys to name him heir to the throne. I don't know that his grace sees it so clearly. Then it lies with you to make him see it. I agree. Sir Hightower, as the king's hand, should absolutely give his opinion on who the king should anoint his successor and whatnot. I'm sure this will all go over well with the king, and Hightower's in no danger of being fired. That would just be silly. Also, seen with a character named Hightower does not include a Bubba Smith or a police academy. Under the dragon's eye. Where's a John Blutarski when you need one? While this carriage car is at most the width of two people on the outside, it somehow has room for three people and a baby with a ton of leg room. Is there a rule that if Matt Smith's in a show, something has to be dimensionally transcendental? <sighs> now I guess I have to rewatch The Crown, Terminator Genesis, and Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Should you be traveling in such condition? The maester said that being out in nature would do me well. The maester was probably implying something more in the mind of strolling around the garden. I very seriously doubt he meant to go on a ride in a carriage that would shake your unborn fetus all over the place. Giving a toddler wine. They already stumble around and pee wherever they like. You don't need to add any alcohol to the mix. <laughs> Premature celebration. Also, this many people show up to watch their king hunt? This is a bigger attendance than you see at a Jacksonville Jaguars game. And yes, I totally made that team name up. <laughs> Much like the state of Delaware, the Jacksonville Jaguars do not exist. When one of Lord Swan's ships sailed through the Stepstones. Lord Swan or his employees are the convenient idiots who sailed through the place where the guy is feeding people to crabs because the plot needed this as a conversation piece. What will happen to Lady Joanna? She's to be sold to a pillow house in the free cities, if you believe the rumors. Pillow houses are awesome. We used to call them pillow forts, but me and my sister used to build them and roll around at the pillow house all the time. I may have misunderstood. Although, considering it's thrones, I may have understood exactly. To get ahead of things, I'd like to point out that this is just glamping, and as I am certain someone on TikTok is trying to rebrand this as kingly camping or some shit as we speak, Hati should be held at least partially responsible. I want a princess. Is your own second name as grand as this? Man, Lord Jason is really good with asking questions. Just taking a guess, but I'm pretty sure future ancestor of Lord Lannister will pick up where Jason left off and start interviewing people for his podcast on serial killers. He probably won't be any good at it and will pay dearly for the career choice, but he'll put his best mask forward in his attempt. Oh, did I say mask? I meant foot. It's weird I would say mask. But the best sport is to be found at Casterly Rock. He's not wrong. At Casterly Rock, they have all kinds of fun and challenging creatures to hunt, such as rabid St. Bernard's, psychic Christopher Walken's, and demonic pin names. The rock is thrice the height of the high tower in Old Town, taller still than the wall in the north. Trying to impress someone with the height of your rock. Why would you need a dragon pit? To house dragons, of course. Lord Jason Lannister would be the dragon king at TV since. Princess, wait! This horse chase chases on for all the some time. Were you ever betrothed to Kristen? I had an adventurous youth when my father served at Blackhaven, to be sure. Sir Kristen went with, yeah, I used to smash all the time, instead of a simple no. The droppings were found half a league to the east. Still fresh. Taking off your gloves to handle excrement. I'm pretty sure this kind of thing is why he's sick all the time. I'm no hunter, but I'm guessing to be successful at a hunt, you should be outside hunting and not inside drinking your weight in wine. There is another choice beyond Casterly Rock. Who do you have in mind? Prince Egon. Diaper proposals. Wait, sibling diaper proposals. <laughs> it's fascinating to me that Renera and Kristen get attacked by a boar in this episode, because a boar is how I would describe the last 31 minutes in change. <laughs> Despite seeming like it's out for blood a moment ago, the wild boar will now seem content with what looks like slobbering tickle time. Many in my line been dragon riders. Very few among us have been dreamers. At first I thought he was talking about being a dreamer, like having hopes for the future, but then... What is the power of a dragon? It's the power of prophecy. I realized he's very much talking about predicting the actual future. He's been making decisions based on the possibility of a dream he had coming true. Viserys is an idiot, and the show cleverly tries to sneak this past us by having him wax all poetic here. What if I was wrong? But even with the knowledge of his buffoonery, part of me is still rooting for this guy. So I have to give one up for Patty Considine for pulling off this clever performance. 
That feeling when everyone is worried about the king's heirs, but you're the only one concerned about the king's stairs. You may not be white, your grace. He's a big lad. That's racist. What was even the point of this ruse when you're gonna have this many people there watching it all go down? Do these clapping assholes look like they know how to keep a secret? Renera's badass blood-covered entrance seems meaningful, almost like it'll change some people's perception of her. But instead of exploring that any further, the writers thought we needed another scene where the character doesn't give a good reason why a woman couldn't possibly be king. Come sweet prince, just give her grace some peace. Aww. Lego my Aegon. You mustn't ignore the certain truth that if Rhaenyra were to step over Aegon to ascend the throne, the realm would tear itself apart. And we mustn't ignore the big orgy painting on the wall of your daughter's room, which doesn't get confusing till the following episodes when Alison becomes very concerned with Rhaenyra's chastity. It wouldn't matter if she were Jaehaerys himself born again. Rhaenyra is a woman. Yeah, this is a stupid and thing to say in regards to why a lot of people would not accept Rhaenyra as the queen, but it's also probably true, which makes it even here. And the fact that even today a lot of this assumption would prove truthful as well is just as depressing. Do you not think my decision correct? It is no consequence to what I think. Great! Skip! And finally, we get to see the battle we've all been waiting for. Even though we had to suffer through 45 minutes of children pouting and fathers hunting and drinking, we're finally gonna get Damon versus the Crab Feeder. Can't wait to see this go on for the next couple of episodes. It's gonna be epic. I'm sure the show wouldn't shortchange us. These shows never give us what we really want. Which is, of course, to know when these game pieces are made and who is responsible for the detailed craftsmanship. There really is nothing worse than getting crabs in your mouth. Wait. I guess it makes sense that Damon undertakes this risky solo mission as he's too prideful to accept assistance from his brother. But it also makes sense because we've gone some time without a sword fight and it's Morbin time. This is badass, but it's also bullshit that none of these arrows killed Damon. Oh good, I was worried we wouldn't get a snapping the arrow off while it's still inside you so you continue to fight cliche. I'm not saying this dragon riding looks fake. No wait, I am. All seems lost for the Triarchy, but Prince Drehar has been a very interesting, mysterious, and formidable opponent. So I'm sure he's got at least one more trick up his sleeve. Never mind. I bet these boring minute and 45 second blood sigil opening credits mean something really cool if you're willing to do a bunch of online research and stuff. <laughs> research. And the castle is surrounded by a deep, dry moat. Thinking that your dry moat is in any way an enticement. It is well fortified against any future Dornish incursions. I could have died and come back to life five times and still not know or care anything about Dorn, beyond their wine, and that I haven't been using the term Dornish incursion as a metaphor for spring break for the past ten years. <laughs> Willem Blackwood doesn't have a bigger part in this episode. Seriously, I'd trade a supercut of him stabbing fools over the long drawn out conversations to follow regarding who's making babies with whom. Don't look, princess. Saying this to the same person you watched viciously stab a boar to death in the previous episode. We should make landfall inside the hour, princess. Oh good, fast travel has been enabled. I was worried they might actually expand the world and let us learn more about the characters during their journeys. That would have been terrible. Take cover! Damon's a cheeky asshole, sure, and I might believe he's enough of a cheeky asshole that he wouldn't care about damaging the boat or the people on it. But why is he putting his precious Caraxes at risk by breaking the dragon hard deck rules? I would say that the show gives us one of those full minute of pointless anticipatory walking scenes here, but it does include one person sweeping the stairs. So, excitement? Thinking you're not at risk because it's just the tip. Once we smash the triarchy, they name me. King of the Narrow Sea. Roll commercials. This entire scene tries to build tension out of Damon's arrival, but instead it just becomes two minutes of boredom. Is someone nearby sexing up their dad's sister? Because I can't hear anything over the deafening sounds of the anti-climax. He hasn't yet seen the new tapestries gifted to you by Norvos and Kohor. Naming your children Norvos or Kohor. How romantic it must be to get imprisoned in a castle and me to squeeze out as. I love Princess Rhaenyra's steadfastness in not accepting her gender roles. I'm sure if she ever does decide to have kids, the show will do an excellent job of helping us understand her character's change of heart and development instead of, oh, I don't know, skipping the entire 10 years when it happens. You've matured yourself these last four years, Princess. You'll get used to the attention. This is just the tip of the spear when it comes to how uncomfortable this relationship is ultimately going to make us. I just realized this boring conversation between these two has been going on over a minute now and I totally forgot I had a skip button. That's on me, lovelies. And by on me, I mean I'm sitting the show for it. Oh, and also... Royal skip! I don't wish to cause you further distress. Well, then maybe don't interrupt. They hadn't completed that last riveting section of the discussion on the sea snake yet. Please, let them fit. 
Joe thinks focusing on the candle being held will distract me from realizing we are yet again just watching people walk around. Show is wrong. Thinking you can tell anything from a sniff test when you're in the shit in the streets stage of civilization. And we're walking again. I swear someone behind the show was like, you know that thing that Sorkin does that people love? The walk and talk? Yeah, let's do that except never at the same time. So anytime someone's talking, there'll be nothing to engage the eyes visually. And anytime people are walking, there's nothing to engage the brain intellectually. It will rule. Well, on its skull, this looks like an overcandling situation, but it's still incredibly dark in here. So my professional recommendation is going to be for bigger candles. For going any subtlety by using a rat as a visual metaphor, AKA departing. He called me boy. The show will use this dragon flame transition so much in this scene that I swear George Lucas called them and was like, fine, I'll stop using wipe transitions in Star Wars. Just cut this shit out already. Bathed and confused. You have a far kind of touch than they do. We're now cutting between an uncle seducing his niece in the Cirque de Hornet district to a decomposing king getting a sponge bath and passionless sex from his young bride. It's like the show is purposely not giving us anything we want to actually see. And call me crazy, but eventually I'm going to want to see something that I want to see. Our good king names his daughter a girl. His heir. I honestly didn't think we could get news position in a world before television, but never underestimate the desperation of scriptwriters. I'm impressed even. Four copper street rat. Street rat? But would they buy that? You'd think that they'd look closer. The king has requested your presence. The hour is quite late. Yes, your grace. Royal booty calls. I'd have given all the sins back if this maid servant had just walked in and said, you up? Not that I can really show you any of it, but seen in a Game of Thrones show uses nudity to pretend to be interesting cliche. Funkle unking. Damon? I know the jig's probably already up, but did you really have to call out his name so people knew without a doubt who you actually are? I guess what I'm saying is, shut your f***ing face, Uncle F***er. <laughs> Wait, is that the same rat from earlier? That's it. If this isn't proven later to be someone warging into this rat to spy on people, we riot. And now these two are going to copulate as well, because why not? I swear as I'm watching this show, my dog is vigorously humping her dog bed. And truly, there's no better metaphor for this show. In both cases, I just let them finish so we can both move on with our lives. At least I thought they were going to copulate. It's almost two minutes later and they're still taking off their clothes. I guess because this relationship is super romantic and will be so meaningful to them both for the rest of the series. I don't need protection from a common or... I'm not casting judgment here. Just saying from a public health standpoint, this sounds exactly like a situation in which someone would need protection. I learned that uh, skin trait could only take me so far in this life. Cool. Could you tell HBO? They were engaged in behaviors unbecoming of a maiden. After that, Viserys asks Otto to elaborate and we get... Damon and Rhaenyra were seen together in the bowels of a pleasure den. And we all know what this means, but Viserys is playing obtuse and requests more explanation and ultimately we land on... Coupling. That's it. After all the foreplay, we get f***ing coupling, which may be the saddest wordgasm I've ever experienced. Also, using the word bowels in the same sentence as pleasure den. What happened last night? What happened last night is a 2016 movie about college students Danny and Sarah who wake up one morning in bed next to each other after a night of hard partying with no recollection of what happened the night before or how they met. Not a single Rotten Tomatoes critic has reviewed it and has a 3.6 rating on IMDb. And I'm so bored by this episode that I swear if it's streaming anywhere, I'm just adding 30 more sins and watching that terrible movie instead of this. And we'll see where it's at. Oh, it's on Voodoo with ads. And since I don't do ads, I guess just the one sin and we get to slog through the rest of this episode together. Yay. You f***ed Damon in a pleasure house. Actually, he said you coupled, which could be anything from light spooning to Manny Petties. So I'm still not sure how anyone knows what you actually did. I was only a spectator. I didn't do anything. Mob mentality. It was foolish of you to place yourself in a position where your virtue could even come into question. Blaming someone for how others choose to see them. Damon's walk of shame is just a regular old vanilla walk of shame and not the usual ultra spicy Westeros style walk of shame. Wait it to me. I hate this family, which I guess is fine because uh, at least I have, um, well there was that one, hmm, the kid from the beginning of the episode was kind of fun. Is he coming back? You believe he lied? How does confessing to such things serve him? Are you serious right now? He literally just told you how. Remember the whole wed her to me thing from like five seconds ago? From my blood come the prince that was promised, and his will be the song of ice and fire. All of this seems really weighty and cool. Until you remember, they crowned f***ing Bran. You are my political headache. Twitter. The gods have a dark wit. Could they pass along some of that wit to the writers of the show? Asking for an audience. Your interests no longer align with those of the realm. Your judgment has been compromised. The issue here isn't that King Viserys is wrong. He's not. 
The issue is that this means we're losing Otto Hightower, who is one of the only interesting characters in the show. This is going to happen a lot, isn't it? I'm sorry, what is that? A tea, princess. It will rid you of any unwanted consequences. Ruining the spirit of tea time. What's today's quarry? Rabbit? Dear. This show often holds up a magnifying glass to how underestimated and belittled women are in the universe, and I'm all for it, but this interaction is a strange way to do it. We find out that Sir Gerald actually thinks extremely highly of Lady Rhea, so why is he being so f***ing patronizing here and assuming she would only be hunting rabbits? Also, those aren't deer, Rhea. Those look like some sort of grouse. You can tell because deer are a lot bigger and don't have wings. The veil sheep might be willing. Assuming livestock, who are unable to consent in any way, are willing to participate in casual bestiality. Come on, Rhea, I know Targaryens have to incest and all, but we need to draw this in line somewhere. <laughs> Damon Targaryen is a dick to horses, and allegedly sheep. Oh, whoops, and ladies of the Vale. Also, I've replayed this scene more times than the editors, and I still don't get it. I don't think that killing Rhea with her own horse was actually Damon's plan, but it certainly f***ing looks like it based on the way he appears to be using the force on his approach. I mean, maybe this was just a big old stroke of luck that he decided to take advantage of, but why does he then bludgeon her to death with a rock? I'm no pathologist, but I think that will make it look decidedly less accidental. Also, also, we've plenty of evidence that Damon thinks he's untouchable, so would he even care about making this look like an accident in the first place? And even if he did, the fact that Rhea dies in a freak riding accident on the one day that he comes to visit couldn't make him look more guilty if he used her blood to graffiti the veil with Damon was here, 116 AC, lol. I knew you couldn't finish. Taunting your almost murderer when it appears they're going to let you live. I mean, sure, she probably would have lost the use of her legs, but if Game of Thrones taught us anything, that's a quick path to getting cool warg powers and eventually becoming king. There's still hope, Rhea. Stop showing me people vomiting. I always thought the Targaryens had naturally white yellow hair, but if that's not the case, I'd think they'd have perfected a method of dying that didn't stain one's forehead. And if Rhaenyra succeeds him, war will follow. Assuming Westeros would plunge into civil war just because a woman sits on the Iron Throne. This is Westeros. Everyone keeps their oaths here. They're not the types to rush a half-ass conclusion to a popular story just so they can speed off to write Star Wars. And to secure her claim, she'll have to put your children to the sword. The princess who's yet to kill anything? Does he think she's just going to waltz in and kill a couple of children? Maybe you could advise your daughter to ally herself with the queen-to-be instead of assuming that two powerful women have to bring each other down like every stereotype ever. Either you prepare Aegon to rule or you cleave to Rhaenyra and pray for her mercy. Risa fans was made for Game of Thrones and Otto Hightower is easily one of the most interesting characters in the series so far. I'm removing a sin for a fantastic performance, but I swear I will add 100 if this is the last time we see him. Alive! I meant see him alive. Riding off into the rain with your hood down. You have a hood, Otto. No wonder you're not the hand anymore. Look, I know it would have been a waste to bring this fancy carriage and not use it, but is there any reason they couldn't have docked over here and saved some time? An outsider among the natives. Creepily sneaking up on a woman who clearly wants to be alone to think. Who has time to light all the candles in this show? This mural does not contain a sea orgy. Strange, considering the amount of semen. Her neck and skull both crushed in the fall. The gods are cruel. And according to Game of Thrones, the gods would appear to be particularly cruel to women, almost exclusively relegating them to the role of sex toys and tragedy pincushions. At such time when their firstborn ascends the Iron Throne, he or she will do so bearing the name Targaryen. So this convoluted bargain has ended up with Viserys promising that his grandchildren will be named Valerian, but will take the name Targaryen when they take the throne. Cool, whatever, but how can he guarantee something that won't come to pass for another 30 plus years when the rate at which he's decomposing suggests he won't even be around next week? I hold nothing against your cousin. Well, that'd certainly be a first for cousins in this show. Dare I say it is a matter of taste. I prefer roast duck to goose. It's nice that Rhaenyra's cool with Laner being gay, but this scene is for the food as a metaphor for sexuality cliche and needlessly confusing my stomach boner. By all rights, you should be queen of the Seven Kingdoms. <sighs> Corliss and Rhaenys have an argument the audience has already been put through for all of the we get the picture sometime. You will need a sworn protector. These two are actually really cute together, and I'm looking forward to finally seeing a healthy and long-lasting relationship between two people I can actually get behind. <sighs> Cindy's about to add a sin instead of removing one, aren't they? It takes 26 seconds for this conversation to start. 26! Do you know how long 26 seconds feels when it's spent watching someone slowly walk across a boat? Do you know what I could achieve in 26 seconds? Twice? I took an oath as a, as a knight of your king's guard, an oath of chastity. I've broken it. Well, yeah, but that didn't seem to be an issue when you were pitching the literal sail off into the sunset plan a few minutes ago. The oath thing only seems to be offending him now that Rhaenyra won't promise herself to him and no one else. So the sin is men. Or monogamy. Or men historically pushing monogamy onto women as a method of control. Pick one. Or all. I've sold my, my, my white cloak. Maybe next time you can avoid that if you hang up your cloak before unsheathing your sword. 
Same, Viserys. Same. But don't worry, we're almost halfway done with the season. <coughs> Baby kids. Who couldn't be bothered to light all of these candles? I'm not unaware that in Flush of Youth... Flush of Youth? You are youth! I know she's probably had to grow up a lot faster than your average young adult, but my goodness, she's talking as if there's been a 10-year time jump that the show never bothered to explain, and that would just be ridiculous. There may be errors made, breaches in resolve, <laughs> breaches or rather lapses. It happened, Your Grace. Thank you! Ten sins off thanks to Sir Kristen Cole, who gallantly fell on his sword and spared us from any more of this tedious dialogue. Oh, he wasn't doing that for us, was he? Why is he admitting this? The sin you allude to. I have committed it. Seriously, why? It's not like he's gonna get a reduced sentence for admitting it before Allison can get it out of him. Either she already knows and he's f***ed anyway, or she doesn't and he has a chance of carrying on as normal. Honorable or not, he gives this information up way too easily just so that the show can have this, oh no, how tragic, he gave himself away moment. At her instigation, it is true. Throwing Rhaenyra under the carriage. Takes two to tango, Sir Kristen. Or whatever the undoubtedly more bloody Westerosi version of tango is. Salsa? Rather than gelding me and having me tortured, you would sentence me mercifully to death. Or take the black, right? If you're really so concerned about your honor, then you could serve in the Night's Watch. Did the show forget about Castle Black? I mean, did Sir Kristen forget about Castle Black? Will I be remembered as a good king, Lionel? I think a good King Viserys is more likely, but you're the boss. It hardly makes a good song, does it? Lamenting the peaceful times you're living and ruling through because you want people to sing a cool song when you're not living or ruling. I often think that in the Crucible, I may have been forged a different man. Says the man currently dying from a case of sitting in a chair. Every time we transition from the king looking ill to a big gathering of ships or people, I always assume we're headed into his funeral, only to be disappointed that it's some other event or wedding or whatever. I love Patty Considine, but funeral edging is my least favorite type of edging. The discount Hogwarts dining hall is looking mighty impressive, but how is anyone at Gandalf the Pale's table supposed to reach half of the food? This is why men wage war. Because a woman would never be ready for the battle in time. Believing war is preferable to taking your time when getting dressed for a party. Also, f Jason Lannister. The man doesn't have Tywin's or Tyrion's brains, Jamie's charm, or Cersei's iron will. I'm not sure where the cool Lannisters will get those things from 200 years from now, but it definitely isn't from should have been a stain on someone's cloak here. Cutting in line. Do you want a red wedding, Sir Gerald? Because this is how you get a red wedding. I'm assuming the place already has ants. Here's a sin for not RSVPing to the not quite the wedding yet wedding dinner. A lot goes into wedding prep, Damon. They usually have seats and dinners calculated out to the exact number of attendees. Next time, check the box on the card and raven it back like a civilized monster. The king will not be happy right in the midst of his speech. Thanks for the update, my man. I really hate it when my shows have even 1% subtlety or subtext in them. I was never much of a dancer. It's not much different to combat. Mm. I shall hope for a different outcome. Dance shadowing. Oh, f you and the poorly paced dragon you lacklusterly flew in on. I will be so mad if the show is telling us that Joffrey has figured out Cole is Rhaenyra's love interest from this look alone. Not a f***ing chance. That's the least believable thing this universe has ever expected me to swallow, and that's including zombies, witches, and the fact that season 8 was designed to be watched in a theater. After my niece's wedding, I plan to fly to the Eyrie and petition Lady Jane myself. Perhaps I'll see you there, Sir Gerald. Oof, this is building to something good. I can feel it. I mean, why else would we spend so much of this episode on Lady Rhea's death and Sir Gerald's rage? There's no way we're skipping past this drama, never to know how it was all resolved. Right? I know who it is. Hmm? The handsome parable. Oh. Sir Kristen Cole. No, you do not! Man, I didn't think there was a chance in hell this show would give us an even more irritating Joffrey, but here we f***ing are. A sworn protector. Look at him. The man is fully Struck. Yes, because there's clearly no other logical reason for her sworn protector to be keeping an eye on her. None at all. In fact, I hear it's easier to protect people if you don't look at them even once. Dancing, spinning, changing partners, excitement? However, music for House of the Dragon is just as wonderful as it was in Game of Thrones, so we're removing a sin for composer Ramin Jishwadi, who doesn't get talked about enough for his wonderful contributions to these shows. Risking this in a crowded room filled with the most powerful and judgmental people in the kingdom, especially after blackmailing one of them. I'm torn here. On the one hand, I love how Rhaenyra calls Damon out on his sh on the other hand, she's encouraging him to commit murder and ultimately incest. Call me woke, but I'm gonna send the incest and murder. Risking this in a crowded room filled with the most powerful and judgmental people in the kingdom, especially after blackmailing one of them. 
Game of Thrones uses a wedding celebration as an excuse for a bloodbath cliche. Also, it might sound obvious, but this feels like a huge overreaction, right? Joffrey has almost as much to lose as Sir Kristen does, so why start with the nuclear option? I'm guessing Sir Kristen is using the Batman logic of if there's a 1% chance of the secret getting out, it must be treated as an absolute certainty. But nobody really liked that movie, so I don't think that's a great place to be taking life advice from. We stand here tonight in thanks and praise to join two souls as one. So poor Joffrey gets his head bashed in and someone's knee-jerk reaction was to skip straight to the wedding and everyone, including his boyfriend, is fine with that? Sir Kristen isn't under arrest or in a f***ing dungeon or something after publicly murdering a man and chinning the Prince Regent to be. Sir Kristen. Interrupting Kristen's atonement for his crimes. This dude killed a man in cold blood during a damn royal feast. She didn't punish him for breaking his oaths to the Kingsguard earlier. Surely she can't let his crime go unpunished this time. She's going to let his crime go unpunished, isn't she? Good golly, what a way to end an episode. This is one of the few occasions where I'm really eager to see what happens next. So many loose ends to tie up, you know? I'm really starting to like these characters and really understand what makes them tick. Especially, hmm, what are the actress names again? I'll just pull up the IMDb. Wait, why does it say young Alicent and young Rhaenyra? No, oh, for f the glazed donut look you've got, but not the glazed donut look you want. I'm torn, because birthing is an intense process that should be depicted so everyone understands how much damage it does to a woman's body. On the other hand, the pilot already showed, in typical Game of Thrones brutality, a deadly medieval C-section. So I guess the sin here is... kids. Walk. Walk. Writers felt that since all the walking in the show had been painful to watch, they might as well double down and make us watch actual painful walking. It is a privilege to be amongst the first to congratulate you. Delaying a woman who is clearly in severe pain to grandstand and somehow make this pregnancy about you. F***ing Lord Caswell. Princess. Sir Kristen is not only alive, but was also allowed to keep his job. Last episode, he smashed a guy's head and then fled the scene, and somehow that was all explained to the satisfaction of the king. Even if this is due to the ever-present incompetence of Viserys, at least give us a scene where the other members of the Kingsguard talk about how he's a loose cannon and none of them wants to be his partner. Looking at Olivia Cook as older, Allison is stunning. The casting for this time change is maybe the best I've ever seen. I mean, look at Emma Darcy. They're incredible. Okay, sin off and then back to me being annoyed. What happy news this morning. While the prevailing wisdom is that Viserys has been dead for at least a couple of episodes now, the show continues to act like he's surviving and not decomposing. Sturdy. You will make a fearsome night. Referring to a newborn baby as sturdy. Also, pigeonholing this baby into the job of a knight. Maybe he'll grow up and want to go into show business as a bard. There's this really successful guy named Yaskier who... Wait, what show am I saying again? Does the babe have a name yet? We haven't Joffrey. Lanor did not birth or even help make this baby, yet he blurts out the first name that comes to mind without consulting his wife. This is how kids end up with ridiculous names like Optimus or Daenerys or Aaron. Can you even imagine going through life with a name like Aaron? What does the second A even do? It's an unusual name for Valerian. Oh, shut up. Your name's Alicent. I think I called the midwife a c Calling your wife a c Okay, so I don't really know what a midwife is, but I presume they deserve some respect. Do you keep trying, Selena? Sooner or later you may get what it looks like you. If you're going to Mori without an envelope and dramatic music, you could at least say, you are not the father. It's like amateur hour in here. Once they're fully bound to you, they will refuse to take instruction from any other. Expo explaining Dragon's position. <laughs> Overcooking your Shevin. I initially wanted to give this scene a sin for doing that thing they do when they make it so I can't see sh but then when the dragon lights the pit of flame and we get that contrast, I was like, whoa, that is really freaking cool. I have to remove one here. But then I remembered the time when they made that whole episode I couldn't see shit, and I decided I was still mad about that. And yes, I know that episode was in Game of Thrones, but House of the Dragon being the firstborn child and rightful heir must now shoulder the responsibility. You'll have to close an eye. I'm sorry, are you doing foreshadowing? If so, it needs to be in the form of something like a burnt teddy bear floating in a swimming pool. You can't just outright say stuff that'll happen in the future. <laughs> It'd be like me saying, I'm going to send more of Allison's behavior. Just the most unremarkable brown horse you ever saw. That's Aquinas. When it comes to full shaming, we say nay. Nature is a thing of mysterious works. Viserys tries to pull a nature, how does it work? As if he's talking about something truly mysterious, like magnets. Did you witness the act itself? <laughs> no, Allison. Because that'd be weird. All the characters in this show have either been aged up or flat out recast. And somehow in that process, the production team managed to make Sir Kristen look younger. She flaunts the privilege of her inheritance without change. As much as I love watching Alicent and Kristen commiserate about their mutual hate for Rhaenyra, 
No, no, wait, I hate it. The show hasn't earned this. All they did was show the two of them talking a couple times in the last episode and tried to play that off as enough evidence to justify how this partnership blossomed off screen. The Princess Rhaenyra is brazen and relentless. I know, right? It's almost like she beat a man to death during her wedding feast. Oh, wait, that was you, Sir Kristen. You're five cents for throwing stones in the glass house of the dragon. Beating your meat in the summer heat till you eat your skeet in the city street. Also, it's funny that out of all the things the writers skipped with time jumps, the one thing they couldn't skip was Aegon pleasuring himself out a window. <laughs> Riveting character development. Whose idea was it? I think it's pretty obvious. You caught him with his hand on the trigger. Oh, you're talking about the little piggy dragon. That doesn't sound much better, but you know what I mean. Either way, the sin here, as always, is parents. Emmett is your brother. Oh, he's a tw <laughs> I can't tell if I just enjoyed this show or if I'm going delirious because of all the walkie-talkie, stabby, f***y, rinse-and-repeat nonsense in every episode, but it still gets a sin for only being a momentary respite. Oh, you are nearly a man grown. How is it that you can be so short-sighted? Well, considering you walked in on him working his gherkin, maybe you should consider that he's quite clearly at the age where his interests do not go with beyond his man grown. Then I won't shut you up. are the challenge! Mm. Allison is right that the boy she just walked in on, in hand, is a challenge. But as far as the story goes, we've seen little to suggest that he is the challenge. And getting through episode after episode of characters refusing to see what is obvious to the audience has become my challenge. Every now and then, it feels like the show suddenly remembers these characters have dragons. It's a lot of fun to watch, but it's also gratuitous. Kind of like all the plane thrusting going on in the opening sequence of Tom Cruise Maverick. We are without responsibility, the political scheming. The endless shifting of loyalties in succession is none of ours. Over the past 10 years, it seems Damon may have acquired a semblance of care for family and future, which makes it a shame that this episode only skims the surface of this potential character development. And for all I know, in the next episode, it will be eight years later, and Damon will be a priest who does traveling Scrabble tournaments, and the show will be like, It happened. F*** you. Deal with it. At my end, I want to die a dragon rider's death. What exactly is a dragon rider's death? I'm assuming it has something to do with being eaten, falling from a great height, or being burned alive. And before you suggest I read the book, let me be the first to welcome you to TV Sins, where we send what's on screen without knowing what's on the page. Stick around. We're getting a petting zoo soon. Soften your knees. <laughs> Feet light. <laughs> Are these instructions supposed to mean something relevant to sword fighting or anything outside the transmutation of matter? Also, why is Sir Kristen allowed to work with kids or anywhere within a hundred yards of a school? Again, I'm only asking because he bludgeoned a man to death. Also, also, he may be the swordsman this series deserves, but he is not the serial Pharrell we need right now. Let's see if you can touch me. You can add that right to the list of things a teacher should never say to a student. The show asks us to believe that Lord Strong ignores the clear issue of Sir Harwin being around Rhaenyra's children, even though this error in judgment goes against his character previously being presented as smart and calculating. I don't mind drama, but I do mind unnecessary dumb drama mixing in with the already existing vast quantities of regular drama. Stay on the attack! Encouraging child abuse because you're still mad about your ex-girlfriend's new side piece. Let it go, dude. It's been some number of years. I'd have a more precise number for you, but the time skips have damaged my personal chronometer calibration beyond repair. Most men would only have that kind of devotion toward a cousin, or a brother, or a son. Losing your temper and resorting to violence because the plot needs it, and not because we know this to be true for your character. We send Sir Kristen for it, and you bet we'll do the same for Sir Strong. You have laid us open to accusations of an uglier treachery. And what treachery? Exactly. All right, how strong now with some skin in the game. And Sir Harwin seems like he could be a formidable ally to Rhaenyra's cause. Hold on, am I starting to care about a character? I think I might be starting to care about a character. Oh boy, I can't wait to see where this goes. Milk swells the breast. Openly discussing your wife's bosom and lactation with another man to show the audience that you are a drunken asshole and not because we have any proof that Carl doesn't know how boobs work. Whoa. Is a foot again in the Stepstones, Rhaenyra. Lenor shouldn't be excited about going back to the Stepstones, but I understand exactly why he wants to go. I don't want to be here anymore either. It's almost like making a world that the characters dislike as much as the audience was a bad idea. A giant, they say, who dyes his beard purple and wears women's frocks. I'm not sure what kind, but this feels phobic. And you live in a world with dragons. How is that the weirdest thing you've heard today? For 10 years, you have indulged yourself at court. Bought the finest horses, drunk the rarest of wines, f the lustiest boys. Writers thought it'd be fun to outline a very colorful decade in Laner's life, but only show us all the sad and depressing parts. You are commanded to remain in King's Landing and at my side. Wait, you can do that? Does that actually work? I feel like Cersei should have just done the same to Jamie in season eight. And now I'm thinking about Go Throne's awful conclusion again. So here's a sin for making me think of season eight. What does Deadmain Dever die? He wants you and father and Baylor 
because you have dragons. There is more than one way to bind yourself to a dragon. I think the lesson here should have been that you're still valuable even if you don't have a dragon. But what do I know? I'm not the blood of old Valeria. And now I ride a bagel. The largest in the world. Bragging about your huge dragon to your daughter who still doesn't have one. Wasting booze. If you don't like the alcohol, don't drink it, but don't waste it. There are desperate skeletons atop grandfather clocks who would love to have that booze. It is Lord Blackwood's contention, therefore, that the Brackens move the boundary stones. And now, as a gesture of ill will, the show will continue its downward trajectory and give us what no one was waiting for, a riveting discussion about a land dispute followed by more indecision regarding what to do about the Stepstones. Of course, the entire conversation serves mostly as a battleground for Renair and Allison to try and best each other at politicking. But it's so dull I'm beginning to wish I hadn't spent so much time complaining about Sir Kristen killing that guy. Which was still dumb, by the way. You may do as you wish, husband. When I am cold in my grave. It is very confusing as to how much power Allison has by law and how much is just due to Viserys having no backbone. Literally and metaphorically. I think it may have fallen out of his ass. The point is, her influence seems to change and become greater with each episode, and we're just supposed to accept it as a matter of fact when it raises relevant questions about how anything works in this world. I have come to resign my position as Hand of the King. I cannot accept this. You can't reject a resignation, Viserys. If someone quits, they quit. If a boss could just decline a resignation and send their worker back out on the floor, I'd still be working at Chuck E. Cheese being spit on and kicked by little children. But I quit. And <laughs> look at me now, in a job of respect, where I'm left mostly without being kicked. Meat without wine is also a sin. Laris releases some prisoners here, which is something I didn't know he had the power to do, and cuts out their tongues so they can't talk about the clandestine activities he's about to put them up to. Which is gross, but fair, I suppose. However, the show glosses over who the people doing the cutting are and how he plans to keep them quiet. Is there a third set of people who cut out their tongues? If so, he'd surely have to keep them quiet too. Where would the tongue cutting stop? You must push now, my lady! Yeah! Mansplaining. I've reached the limit of my art. Really? Because the limit of your art seems to be staring at the baby door and yelling, push. I'm not saying that Lena wasn't capable of moving so quickly that Damon couldn't catch up to her before she got all the way outside and over to Vagar. What I am saying is that Damon might be phoning in this foot chase just so the episode could end with the multiple fire-related deaths of characters the show has barely attempted to make us care about. You always said if you were absent from court, she would pour her honey in your father's ear. Gross. Lena. Bring him. These two have been navigating the ups and downs of their sham marriage for 10 years, and in the end, we can still see that on some level they care for each other. This relationship is just one more example of great shit we missed in the time jump. All of Laris' men wear a bug on their bonnets, because the best way to get away with secretly murdering your father and brother is by giving your henchmen the same brooch that is attached to your cane. As we all know, the success of such ventures really comes down to branding. I love this show, but it needs to sort out these pacing issues and give the characters room to breathe. In one episode, you introduced us to the father of Renera's children, gave him enough depth to be interesting, and then immediately killed him off. HBO will probably give you as many seasons as you need. Slow down. You may know what is the right thing to be done, but love stays the hand. Sho makes a valiant attempt to amp up the drama with this creepy monologue talking about not being able to do what is necessary because of the love you have for your children. The problem with this logic is that all of the characters in this show are terrible parents. Love is a downfall. I know they filmed a scene with Damon hugging his children. A screenshot was shared on social media before the episode aired. So why did you cut it? It would have been a great character moment to reveal the shred of humanity we didn't believe Damon had in him. How is there time for Aegon's wanking but not Damon hugging his daughters? You've heard the stories of Harren Hall, your grace. It's built in hubris by Harren the Black as a monument to his own greatness. Not content with all his monologuing, Larry then decides to open the robes of history, nakedly spouting knowledge like some sort of expositionist. As I brace myself for another episode of succession planning, incest flaunting in, well, walking, I find myself wondering, do they have these caskets ready to go or is the funeral put on hold until one is made? If they're pre-built, how early is too early to have one ready without being in bad taste? Also, while we're being disrespectful, did they really need the whole casket? I mean, she was just a skeletal ash pile at the end. Wouldn't have been easier to make a bust and save everyone the crafty time? None of the people out here on the rocks would hear this whispered funeral speech for Lena, so why risk the rocks at all? It's not like anyone's trying to take a perfectly cinematic picture. Show tries to coax sadness from me, but forgets that it's conditioned me to feel nothing while watching because everyone dies a horrible death regardless of my investment. Otto's back! Hip hip hoo! Wait a minute. He's the hand again? We didn't even see Lionel die! Wait, his name was Lionel, right? Anyway, this badge is doing the narrative legwork of confirming that Lionel Strong is dead and that Viserys has decided he's able to trust Otto again. Why does this show persist in refusing to give me the sh I actually want to see? 
Me too, Aegon. Me too. I mean, Aemond. Aegon? Aemond. Wait, Aegon. No, no, Aemond. Definitely Aemond. No, it's Aegon. Aegon. 100%. Right? It took so long for this casket to drop into the sea. And while I know that we're meant to feel the importance of the ritual, we have other things to be interested in here. For example, Renera isn't queen yet. Let's get to that because we want to see her rule for a long, long time. Okay, crew, we've got five minutes of staring followed by 20 minutes of some shit that's so dark it's essentially unwatchable. But before that, let's release the dragons. That'll buy us some goodwill and maybe keep people... Uh, guys? Why do the dragons even look miserable now? The next eight minutes are filled with post-decade skip characters that we barely know anything about, exchanging uncomfortable glances. Pepper into this sad soup the awkward bubbling tension between children who are groomed to despise each other. The result is a viewer, like myself, forced to fill in the quiet spaces with my own version of what the glances and anger mean. It's exhausting. I hate it. Nope, but you know who should be this f***ing smirky asshole that everyone should be suspicious of at this point. Hand, Spool of green, spool of black, dragons, the flesh, weaving dragons of thread. Sharing your poetry with arachnids. Both my seat and high tide will be yours one day, Lucerus. They will not. I mean, I have no idea if that's true or not, but I'm willing to wager that all these people die horrible deaths and none but the rats live happily ever after. Retrieve your patron. Subtlety. Okay, we've given this show a lot of stick for putting us through conversations that are boring and don't do anything to progress the story, but they've somehow found something even more boring. Watching those same conversations from the perspective of someone who can't even hear what's being said. I'm going to bed, Emperor. A quarter, an entire quarter of this episode has been spent at the funeral of a character we barely got to know, certainly didn't know long enough to truly care about. And yes, I know the funeral's a thematic backdrop for the actual meat of the scene, but when that meat is a patty of reminding us that the newly appointed Lord Strong is creepy, no one likes Rhaenyra, Aegon is a jerk, and the king is still decomposing, then I'm gonna want a refund for my meat, because it tastes like sh and disappointment. So, and forgive me if I'm wrong here, usually, usually, you're able to see what's on screen. But because this show is stupid, it decided to spill dark ink into a black void, retrieve a sample with a spoon made of sh**, stir in Satan's tears, smear the residue on a pane of glass, and use that as a filter over the cameras for basically the remainder of this episode. In order to help everyone out, I'll be narrating what happens next to speed us along. He's drunk. He's an ass. He's a thief. He's drunk and he's tolerated. She's sad and he's ambitious. She's horny. He's bored. Oh, there's an ocean here and a beachy tent thing for such an occasion as impromptu fornicating. A big dragon is sad and then stolen. The dragon flies around for nearly five minutes. Kids talk to kids about kid stuff. The two people that f***ed on a beach aren't picking sand out of their cracks. Kids go full on Lord of the Flies with the torchlight finally ending the complete darkness. I gave up the idea of wearing a crown a generation ago. It is you, Lord Husband, who refuses to abandon this pursuit. Rhaenys would be excellent at TV sins. And please, Corliss. Give it up too. We've had this Rainey should have been queen debate over and over and over and over and over and over and we get it. He thinks she should be queen. She is not queen. He does not like that she is not queen. She does not mind that she is not queen. Stop it. I know better than anyone that our marriage is a farce, but I at least make the effort to maintain appearances. An effort wasted, it seems, when others would send his lover to fetch him out of the water and not you. I'm no longer a child. Wasn't... wasn't there a scene where these two nearly f***ed in a brothel? I think the innocence of childhood wasn't really an issue at any time, so why is it coming up now? Also, they hook up in a brothel. They almost hook up at a wedding dinner. They hook up on the damn beach after his wife's funeral. I'm beginning to think that they're basing this relationship on a mutual love of exhibitionism. And strangely, that didn't even rank in the top 10 reasons you don't date your uncle article I just finished. Are we finally to the part where we get to assume Renair is now pregnant so we can finally care about Danny and John's eventual appearance in this world? Look, I know we're giving this episode a hard time, but it bears repeating that I truly am stunned to find ourselves once again saying that we can't see sh** in a Game of Thrones episode without jacking up the contrast on my TV and undoing all the effort that presumably went into this day for night filming choice. Also, for those of you who may not know, day for night is a filming technique used to simulate night without having to actually film at night, saving a bunch of time and money, but at the expense of the end user. It's kind of like taking your kid to the Disney store because it's closer and cheaper than Disneyland, but somehow even more disappointing. Just when I thought I couldn't sin more walking, the show dangles a beautiful new example of wasted wandering in the form of a dragon walking on air. If Fabio can't make it through a single roller coaster ride without taking a goose to the face, there's no way Eamon can make it through the birds here. Who is it? Question I ask whenever I see one of Viserys' and Allison's kids appear on screen somehow makes its way into the episode. Who is it? Question I ask whenever one of Rhaenyra's kids appears on screen somehow makes its way into the episode. Who is it? Question I've been asking for the last 15 day for f 
Night Minutes somehow makes its way into the episode. Maybe your cousins can find you a pig to ride. It would suit you. Of course, the easy sin here is kids, but I just don't feel as if that covers my level of discomfort in being made to watch half a dozen children beating the Monday to Friday snot out of each other and one of them losing an eye. So let's send the fact that somebody thought of this scene, wrote it, got the kids to act it out, and then assumed millions of people would enjoy it. But also, kids. How could you allow such a thing to happen? I really hope he's asking this question into a mirror. Like, how are there no adults watching the kids, even though they all stand to inherit massive responsibilities and lands and crowns and sh**? How have they all snuck out to kill each other without one person noticing? Why are guards so hard to find during the stabbing parts of the episodes? Over an insult. My son has lost an eye. Well, you know the old saying, an eye for an eye, know who your real daddy is. Where is Selena? Entertaining his young squire's adventure. Okay, we're about to get into a big hoo-ha and kerfuffle because accusing the princess's kids of being bastards is a treasonable offense, but Alicent can get away with calling out Prince Lenore's sexuality and fidelity as if it's nothing more than a heavy night at the tavern? That is insufficient. My thoughts about this entire f***ing prequel make it into, I think you get the message by now, I am not having a good time. Rather than disarm Alicent, everyone stops to see if her slashing resulted in a visible wound. Rather than stop the bleeding, everyone stops to look at Alicent to see if her slashing resulted in remorse. What that rogue Aemon has done in winning Vega to our side, it's worth a thousand times the price he paid. A thousand eyes? I know he's being hyperbolic, but you try getting your eye removed a thousand times before you go throwing around false equivalencies like that. My god. Goodness, for the love of all that is holy, use a smaller needle. Also, actually, here's an idea. Stop showing us people getting stitches. I have an imagination, and as I'm already using it to think of all the things I'd rather be watching right now, I may as well use some of that bandwidth to imagine the stitches myself. Also, also, do you think that the writers have a certain quota for their series? Like, we need to see the body endure brutality at least 14 times each episode, or on average, 1,921 times each season. Bonus points for needles. And if they do, why do they think that keeps people interested? Also third of his name. Someday I will remember to not eat food while watching this f***ing show. Yeah, but I'm sure even in these primitive times, there's some ointments that can... Oh, she's being metaphorical, isn't she? Carry on. These are dangerous times. You don't say. Must be a day that ends in Y. God, why isn't this episode over yet? We could not marry unless Leonor were dead. I know. Let's talk about the villain's plan. And for clarity on this occasion, the villains we're talking about are Damon and Rhaenyra. They're going to trick everyone into thinking that Lenor was killed by his lover in a sword fight in the heart of Driftmark, but actually send him and said lover off to a whole new world so that Rhaenyra is free to immediately marry Damon. <laughs> Look, even if this plan goes off without a hitch, which of course it does because they pull an Ocean's Eleven and montage it as it's being described to us, that still leaves Lenor out in the world capable of exposing them the second he realizes life as a commoner ain't all it's cracked up to be. Also putting aside the fact that they're robbing Corliss and Rhaenys of their last child, Rhaenyra and Damon both acknowledge that remarrying so quickly will immediately attract all of the murdery suspicions to be cast on Rhaenyra. But I suppose they just think, hey, f*** it. If we're lucky, we're about to hit another six-year time jump, so we won't have to deal with any of these pesky immediate consequences. No! No. Showing favoritism. Introducing a brand new character in the last 10 seconds of your episode. Remember the original Game of Thrones credits? Remember how it would fly over the map to give you a sense of geography and enhance the show you were watching? Yeah? Well, this show was like, nope, we're going with blood culverts emptying into Metal Gears because who doesn't like a bit of pointless and unintelligible trickle-down necronomics? Also, show's logo promises a three-headed dragon, and I'm starting to doubt we're ever going to see one. It's been near six years since I last saw my lord husband, Maester. Six years? Six years?! You have arguably the best ending of the season in the previous episode, and now we're skipping ahead six years and not getting into anything that happened right after all that chaos? F*** the show sometimes, man. Although, I think it would actually probably enjoy that. The sea snake is strong. Calling your grandpa the sea snake instead of grandpa. You didn't put all that work into impregnating your grandmother and then going through nine months of putting up with her being pregnant for you to show such disrespect. I am the sea snake's own blood. The closest kin he has left. Be careful, good brother. One could take your words for treason. Or one could take his words as completely unimportant, since I'm not even sure the show really knew he existed until now. My cousin the king would have your tongue for this. Tongue shadowing. Giving us so much gratuitous castle porn, I half expect the Downton Abbey theme to start playing. Stealing babies. Mouth. Oh, God, she knew that. 
admonishing yourself in the third person like some sort of 21st century teenager. At this point, just have the kid call his dad's plans cap and brag about his drip, which I swear is a real thing. A king should honor the traditions of his forebears. Thinking that following Yogi, Baloo, Pooh, and Fozzie will help you be king. There's only one bear we follow in these parts, and his name starts with a P and ends in an Addington. He means to call into question Luke's legitimacy. Ah, goody, another episode revolving around political chess, because this show never tackles this subject matter enough. This back and forth of who gets to be king and who gets to be head of this castle or that land is enough to lose your head over, or at least half of it. Vaman cares only about Driftmark and the Valarian Nine. Not about our politics. I don't care about them either. So enough of the housing. Can we please move on to the of the dragoning? To King's Landing then. Cool, we're headed back to King's Landing. Wouldn't want this show to stop feeling cramped and insular, would we? I would say it's nice to be home, but I scarcely recognize it. Something I find even less exciting than political chess matches is characters complaining about decor. Seriously, guys, if it doesn't get more exciting than this, I might chop my own head off. Or at least half of it. We'll continue to enjoy improved customs duties since the settling of the Stepstones. House of the Dragon episode can't exist without mentioning the Stepstones cliché. I trust they've been welcomed as befits their station. As you instructed, Lord Hand. One thing these time jumps do is take away any suspense or dramatic pleasure we might have been able to get from past actions that we never saw take place. Yes, we knew the Hand from six years ago was killed, but we never actually saw the scene stealer from Notting Hill get to take his old position back. Considering how much dramatic weight was given to him having his position taken away, this could have actually been an interesting development to see. But instead, he's already just back in his seat, putting his balls on the table. He can fly a dragon, yes, but... Can he command a fleet? A bullet, he does not alter his claim. This episode is like if Succession focused all of its energy on successions that weren't even the main succession, and was also really boring. Shall we levy a tax on the sale of the new wool? Aw oh, man, we're leaving the scene right as they're getting into some new wool tax discussion. Damn it, I wanted to hear about that. A matter has arisen that requires your attention. Whatever it is, Sir Eric, you need to wait. I'm Eric, your grace. Imagine not having subtitles on and being like, Oh, you're Eric, not Eric. Got it. I swear this Eric, Eric nonsense better lead to some first-rate parent trapping, or for the love of Haley Mills, I will revolt. Who goes there? Father. No, you, Rhaenyra. He, father. I'll be up. And by up, I mean my reclining position will go from approximately 15 degrees to about 20 degrees. But it's really important that the audience understand what bad shape I'm in, so here we are. The sea snake has taken a grave wound in battle in the stepstones. When? You won that four years ago. Even senile and decaying, Viserys would be excellent at TV sins. <laughs> now that is a lame. Fit for a king. And apparently a grandson slash nephew that your daughter is a mother slash cousin to. I believe you. You do? I do. But what I worry about. Starting the next sentence after saying I believe you with the word but. Have you seen Diana? She's supposed to dress the children. Convenient affected third party barge in is convenient. I'd be surprised if he could remember his own name. To be fair, there's only about three names to go around in your family, so I bet he gets there pretty fast. Smaller than I remember. It looks exactly the same. Conversation in every one of my sex tapes? Wait, is the Valerian Banner a seahorse? And Corliss goes by the name Sea Snake? Is everything and everyone in this house a C word? Wait. Lightning crashes, a new mother cries. The Song of Ice and Fire, do you believe it to be true? The first few volumes, sure, but I'm pretty sure the rest is a myth. Also, this is as good a time as any to send this show for not even touching on the more magical aspects that the OG Game of Thrones did so well. That show literally started with an army of frozen dead people, and this show's like, we've got dragons and that's all you're getting. My nature. Royal skip. Sweet. Of all the things I was hoping this show would take the time to flesh out a bit more, Viserys' back sores were top of that list. Hurrah! The Lord of Dritchmark and Lord of the Tides. And rings? Are you the Lord of those two? I only ask because I might all of a sudden get interested in the show again. King Viserys of House Targaryen! Now we're talking! Finally some energy in this episode. Viserys showing up to put people in their place is awesome. But the fact that it took 40 minutes to get here and the most decrepit character in the series to make it happen still deserves this sin. Those who have seen your face draw back in fear. The phantom of the harbor is here inside your- I will sit the throne today. Ha! Yes! 
fine. Take this in off. The scene rules. But also, the king sitting the throne that is essentially responsible for his current conditions seems a little ironic. Or at least Alanis Morissette's version of ironic. I do not understand why petitions are being heard over settled succession. Well, it's this thing called dramatic tension, and the show needed something to occupy itself with instead of fleshing out the backstories and character development of the other main characters while they stall and get to the final two episodes. That help? My house survived the doom. He's got a good point. That's nothing to sneeze at. That was a really tough game. The Inferno episode was especially tough, but still, bragging will always get you a sin, so. I will not see it ended on the account of this. Say it. <laughs> Matt Smith coming through in the clutch again. Almost saving this episode. One more sin off for the final bits of this thing, but that's all you're getting. The Silent Sisters are attempting to put Vaman back together again instead of just embracing his new role as a marionette. I think the thing that surprises me most about this scene is it's only the eighth strangest thing I've seen on television this week. To be fair, I did just catch up on season eight of The Masked Singer, though. Also, I love that even in a scenario where the body on the table has his chin separated from the rest of his head, they still bother to place a towel over the private parts. This overcandling wall behind Rainis is the most overcandled wall to ever overcandle. Might as well be a Christmas display on one of those houses that people with too much time on their hands own. This is an occasion for celebration, it seems. He says, just a few hours after a person had his head bisected before him as he sat on the throne. Prince Osiris, a future lord of the tides. I'm actually really glad this all worked out this way. Prince Lucerus is sure to grow into a noble king, and since we spent so much time with him on this episode, you know his reign will be food for the story for years to come. Good thing he's not going anywhere. You do know how the act is done, I assume. Getting one-upped by the kid who married his sister. Exposing your eye rectum at the family dinner. I wish to raise my cup to Her Grace the Queen. Awkward dinner toasts, which is also what most people would call every single dinner toast. Also, I do like what the show is doing here. The idea that Viserys could make one final push for unity and it would find purchase in the hearts enough to mend moats is a beautiful idea and completely insane. These two crossed the line and overturned on their relationship a long time ago, and no amount of one-eyed speechifying is ever going to change it. We have now reached the portion of the episode where people stand up, and then other people look at the people standing up, and then stay standing up for several seconds as the cameras beg us to feel tension. The only thing I'm wondering is... I would like to toast Vela and Reyna. Oh, come on. At this point, I'd rather be watching someone make actual toast than sit through another one of these things. I know we've been through a few time jumps, but did Eamon's time jumps have a plus 10 modifier on them? Why does this child look 31? Harlem. Return on Dragonback. Get it? It seems like she means in a friendly way, but then it probably won't be. Get it? Do you get it? Oh, good. We're bringing her back. You know, her. I totally know who she is. I just want to make sure you know who she is. There are too many damn characters to keep up with on this show. Oh, don't you remember Egon? Our son. The prince that was promised. Prince Egon. He met the realm. I understand, my king. And this is why you don't name all your kids George Foreman. All of this rock phlebotomy got immediately more interesting once I found out this was an overcomplicated family tree. But now that I'm actually interested, the whole thing moves so fast that it's damn near impossible to get a glimpse of what it all means. Plus, since we're dealing with the Targaryens, shouldn't the blood be flowing uphill occasionally? Not content with long ponderous shots of people walking, Hot D has now removed the walking and will just be long ponderous shots of empty rooms. But also, Ramin Dejwadi's music continues to be an inspiration throughout the entire series. No matter the scene, he always knows how to set the mood. Take your sin off, damn it. And we're back to some walking. A full 30 seconds of this boy walking, in fact. Are we sure this was based on Fire and Blood and not George R. R. Martin's lesser known Blood and Cardio? Quietly in the background for multiple episodes, Talia's been a character with few words. So revealing that she's also had a lot of influence in this world is cool and introduces the idea that background characters could be more than just extras. But when that extra is also a producer, the surprise is not as surprising as you might think. Playing with your balls on the small council meeting table. Wait until you're alone to do that. Trust me, if your coworkers find out your balls have been on the table, it's a whole thing. Uh, or so I've heard. What is it that could not wait an hour? title in Lannister. Does he really think an urgent summons to a small council meeting would be over something insignificant? You knew the king was unwell and ready to die any day. This is the most read the room situation to ever have a room ready to be read. Aren't the Lannisters supposed to be smart and cunning? Here's two cents for not being Tywin. I miss him so much. We grieve for Viserys the Peaceful. Viserys the Peaceful? Did he pick that name out himself? This is almost as bad as Bran the Broken. I said almost. Then we may proceed now with the full assurance of his blessing on our long laid plans. 
immediately admitting you had long laid secret plans in the room with the person whose back you were plotting behind. Tylen not only remains a moron, but this over explaining for narrative sake is an insult to Alicent and the audience. I'm sorry, but I'm really hung up on these balls. Are they supposed to serve as proof that the person you see in the room is actually in the room? Is the council not in session or something until all the balls are in their sockets? Both of those would be fine, I suppose. But if that's the case, then these things are just a formality. And I can't see why this group that's been planning to usurp the throne gives a shit about these balls now that Viserys is dead. Why is the show smashing us upside the head with these things? That was some 20 years ago. Most of them are now dead. Well, I'm glad someone's keeping track of the chronology through all these time skips. The old gods and the new all understood I wasn't. And I will not believe that he said this on his deathbed alone with only the, the boy's mother as a witness. At least someone on the small council is making logical sense. I look forward to hearing more wisdom from Lord Beesbury as the show continues. Well, sh All right, here we go. Sir Kristen Cole about to finally face some consequences. And... Damn it! When is this man going to pay? What's it gonna take for him to get to the find out part after f***ing around so much? Here's two cents for letting this asshole get away with murder while not having enough charisma to justify it. But he has four daughters, all of them unmarried. Further relegating the role of women to being nothing but political bargaining chips in a scheme for power. You may say, that's just how the world was back then. Surely you can't send the show for an imperfect system that was limited by the times, right? And we'll remind you that this is TV Sins, where we can and do sin whatever we want. Stick around. We have a cool clown that makes shadow puppets on Tuesdays. As Lord Beesbury's head lays cracked open on his power stone, it should now be obvious to everyone in the room that you can have your balls and you can have your Sir Kristen, but you cannot have both. One more word and I'll have you removed from this chamber and sent to the wall. Oh, good to know the Night's Watch still exists. I was starting to get worried you forgot about them. You know a show's getting claustrophobic when I'm begging for more of the wall. Sir Harold detaches his cloak so easily he's left Edna Mode asking, why didn't I think of that? I recognize no authority but the king's, and until there is one, I have no place here. Show upholds a long tradition of creating a character we might dare like, just to have them written out of the episode. If one possesses a thing, the other will take it away. Yes, princess. Helena's prophecies are an interesting and mystical addition to the show, but weirdly, we know that they're prophecies, but none of the characters seem to have caught on. The way everyone treats her, it seems like she's been saying strange things all the time for decades now. So aside from plot points, she has to be giving people a heads up on things like burnt tongues, stubbed toes, and the gastroenterological effects of their bean consumption. Just saying, no one ever knows the soup is too hot. There is a beast beneath the board. Helena's prophecies may often come true, but I'm just not sure what predicting Shaq's entrance to the NBA has to do with this show. Find him. Thus begins the pointless race between Alicent and Otto to accomplish basically the same goal. Here's three cents for finding yet another way to waste our time. The lightness of this shot makes the darkness of this shot only possible if Rhaenys opening this window somehow just brought balance to the force. Also giving the queen who never was a room with a view. Entering the queen's chambers without knocking or announcing yourself. This isn't your castle, Kristen. Have some respect for boundaries. Here's five cents just for being you. He said time to get it wet. The same thing I said to my younger brother the first time we set up the slip and slide in the yard somehow makes it into the episode. You'll not leave this room without declaring your intention. In bed. Haha, <laughs> gotcha good, Otto. I'm sorry, this is probably the best episode they've had all season, but I've just been so bored by all the others leading up to this that I'm finding it hard to care about anything that's going on. How exactly does Scary Larry always have such great seats to every single important moment in King's Landing? Does he have a special code at StubHub? And by StubHub, I of course mean the local ticketing agency run by all the citizens that got caught stealing by the Kingsguard. I got one of many I'd wager. Ah yes, the old King Robert strategy. Maybe one of them will grow up to be an underutilized plot device. Could he be any more obvious about sneaking out? For Pete's sake, man, use the back exit or something. No wonder you got caught. F***ing Lord Caswell. He tolerated the prince's proclivities for years. Because it was my sworn duty, Eric. Based on the carbon dating of Viserys' corpse, this show has been going on for like 2,000 years. And in all that time, the writers couldn't show us Sir Eric tolerating the prince's proclivities. So now we have to sit through discount Errol Flynn and discount Errol Flynn, arguing the exposition onto the screen. Where were you going then with such urgency? Come on, man. You were clever enough to engage in some subterfuge in the throne room, but now you can't even attempt to lie to save your own life? Your wife is sick. Your castle was raided by bandits. They just opened a Whataburger back home. Anything will do! You've spent many hours with the Queen of late. Otto brings this up to Laris because he thinks something is afoot, and the meetings with Allison have aroused suspicions. Which is all well and good, but it doesn't make this line... There's no reason those hours cannot, in the end, benefit you. Any less up when we learn more about those hours later in the episode. These silent sisters seem really cool. I can't wait to dive into their lore and learn more about them. 
I'm sure the show won't let such interesting characters go unexplored. Alice's display of emotion during her final moments with the body of Viserys presents an interesting complexity. It's almost like these two shared more than arguments over heirs, betrothals, and successions. But if that were true, I'm sure we would have seen it on screen, right? My sincerest regrets for the lack of ceremony. In bed. Ha <laughs> ha, got you good, Alicent. I'm sorry again. This is a really good scene, and I love seeing these two go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, but it's pretty absurd that much of this conversation hasn't already occurred between the two of them. I mean, for a while now, Viserys has been knocking on Heaven's door, so there was no need for all this patience. You should have been queen. No sh**, Alicent. If you want to apply to join our team of pointing out the obvious, we'll happily send you a raven. Without your dragon, she may be persuaded to negotiate. Let's check the math on that one. Suppose you take Maelys off the table. Rhaenyra still has Cyrax, Daemon has Caraxes, Bela has Moondancer, Laenor left Sea Smoke behind, Jaceris has Vermax, Lucerus has Arax, and Joffrey has Taraxes? That's seven dragons. Meanwhile, Alicent, each of your three children has one. Now, we typically let Cinny handle the math, but I'm pretty sure seven is still bigger than three. Let's take a moment to talk about these disguises. Not since Yennefer of Vengerberg wore a hood over her head have we seen such shoddy disguises. Y'all make Clark Kent's disguise look well planned. Cole and Amon happen upon this secret meeting, which is a massive stroke of luck. Wait a second, a meeting like this out in the open for all to see? Well, that is just a plot convenient misstep on the part of Otto in The White Worm. Almost like they're not two of the smartest characters in the whole show. My condolences on the passing of your king. All right, I can't deny that it's awesome how the writers brought back Masaria as an unexpected power broker with some serious sway over who will inherit the crown. It reveals how the whole insulated world of kings and queens is still very much connected and influenced by the world at large, something that's been missing from the show up to this point. I'd best secret him somewhere safe. Title of my sex tape? I could have killed him as easily as a wasp on fruit. Have you ever tried to kill a wasp? Those f***ers are fast and mean. There's a reason the cans of spray they make to kill them shoot up to 30 feet. So the sin here is for wasps. And you're underestimating of those little stabby hellions. There is no power but what the people allow you to take. Yeah, this discount Peter Baelish knowledge is power scene really loses its punch when you realize all her leverage goes out the door the moment Aegon is found. Then we'll see who becomes a wasp on fruit. Or some other cool metaphor that makes me sound smart. Masari hit Aegon under the candle table in the Sept? In episode 4, when Damon was half in the back, he got a private room and a bed and some morning go juice. I'd be remiss if I didn't call out the waning standards of the White Worm's hospitality. Also, speaking of early season Damon, whatever happened to the Damon is impotent storyline? Is that just never going to come up again? Why won't you finish what you started? Seriously, it can't be that hard. Swords! Tackling! Tickling? Excitement! Let me go, or we'll find a ship and sail away, never to be found. Sorry, Aegon. Only one character gets to escape secretly by boat, and we already gave that pass to Laenor. Also, if you wanted to flee by ship, you haven't done that by now. Viserys has been dying for like 50,000 years. Surely in all that time, you could have found that secret cave everyone in Game of Thrones knew about and frequented. Well played. None of this is a game. Yes, it is. It's a Game of Thrones. Or did you forget which prequel you were in? There's no better word for the last 20 minutes this episode wasted other than a game. A pointless, dull game. That was the worst edition of Hide and Seek I've ever seen. And I once watched some of my college roommates get drunk and then try to stuff their- Or you, his daughter's childhood companion. Kristen Cole will be named Lord Commander of the King's Guard. If you want to promote someone with a proclivity for killing innocents, that's up to you. But at least do it at a time when it makes sense as opposed to bringing it up as a non sequitur in a conversation that had everything to do with your relationship with your father and nothing to do with the King's Guard. You look so much like your mother in certain lights. Aww. Ew. What, is this the most photogenic cane in the world? We get it, this means something. Stop beating us over the head with it and use it on one of the characters we hate. Preferably Sir Kristen. Show doesn't clarify that the being into feet part isn't what's wrong with this scene. It's the uncomfortable way Laris goes about getting the feet that makes him the heel. When the queen dies, the bees fly without purpose. Actually, if queen dies, the beehive works quickly to replace her, usually after a month or so. Science is neat. What's he doing? He's whittling on a piece of wood. Beating your meat to the queen's feet till you yeet your skeet in your, um, pantaloons? Chewing with your mouth open. I see we've graduated from walking and moved on to dramatic eating, dramatic standing, dramatic sitting, more dramatic standing, and dramatic doing that thing when you're sitting high up in a bed against the headboard. With me, princess. Renice doesn't question exactly who you are. Seriously, I have no idea if this is Eric or Eric, and that detail has become a contributing factor to suspense that I'm not sure the writers created intentionally. Oh good, another excellent disguise. Are the cloaks in Westeros magical so they keep your identity secret? Did I miss that part in the books? <laughs> Just kidding, I didn't read the books. <laughs> Literacy. 
Oh no, not that building. Okay, I have no idea where this fire is or why it matters. I believe the show wants us to think this is Masaria's house. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. No one cares about that right now. But this shadowy figure does make me question how the criminals Laris enlisted as his foot soldiers were not good enough to previously evade capture by the City Watch, but are now all ninjas straight from the League of Shadows. <laughs> Laris has foot soldiers. Renice and, um, Rick run into traffic because without proper motivation, they need these extras to push these characters in the direction the story needed them to go. Because he didn't like me. Thinking that naming your heir is about picking your favorite. It's not about favorites, Aegon. If it were, he'd have named his model of King's Landing as his heir. We all saw how he looked at it. Do you love me? You imbecile. Answering a yes or no question with an assessment of intelligence. Our beloved King Viserys the Peaceful is dead. Show doesn't acknowledge that the confusion in the crowd is due to the fact that no one thought he was alive to begin with. Royal skip. Oh, wait, sorry. Force of habit. Oh well, too late now. On to the next scene. Cool entrance, bro, but this still seems a bit dangerous. Knowing Aegon, he's just as likely to troll them by taking a step backward and taking a blade to the skull. And the sin, of course, is that this doesn't happen. For all of Allison's talk earlier about how important it was to keep Rhaenys' dragon, she sure made zero effort to secure the dragon pit. Show takes this long to realize what I actually meant when I said that I wanted to see a crowning scene. No offense, but Homelander did this scene better. Wow, I have to say, this is a really exciting way to take the interesting suspense thriller of an episode you managed to pull off and turn it into a big question about how few f**ks Rainies gives about the citizens of the realm. Also, cool entrance, bro, but I have a few notes. First, how were you not smooshed to death when your dragon came through the ceiling? Where did you get that neat armor? Was your dragon holding it for you? And finally, why not just escape from the dragon pit through another exit? You clearly didn't come up here to kill the high towers, and doing so put your life at risk. This move looks all of the cool, but makes none of the sense. Open the doors! Open the doors! If Otto Hightower ends up being named Odor because he can only say Odor for the rest of his life, I will give back every single sin. Whoa. Okay, that was cool. But also anticlimactic. 39 seconds of map porn. Also, it's pretty bold to follow two minutes of mapping in the opening credits with yet another tracking map shot. Even Magellan doesn't like this much map. The sea snake is going to die, isn't he? Which one's the sea snake again? I'm getting really tired of having to pause and check previous notes every time a character talks. TV shows shouldn't require this much research. Remember when we just had to try and figure out which famous guest star was the murderer on Matlock each week? And if your next question is, what's a Matlock? I'd kindly like to ask you to get off my lawn. I don't want Driftmark. Maybe you should have spoken up a couple of episodes ago when they were clearing up your inheritance and that poor guy got his face bisected then. You can't let hesitation eat you alive, Lucerus. Not unless you're trying to egg on conversations that needlessly drag on. We don't choose our destiny, Luke. It chooses us. That's a weird way to say some people are born into rich and privileged families and some aren't, so quit being a whiny-ass kid and enjoy your unearned fortunes. Do you want to know the truth of it? Royal skip. I was four and ten. Same as you are now. The f is this four and ten nonsense? Look, we made our piece with spelling the names all weird with extra Y's and L's, but we draw the line of math. Just say he's 13, damn it, or I'll add four and ten extra sins. In time, I came to understand I had to earn my inheritance. You don't earn an inheritance. It's something given to you when someone else dies. That's kind of the point. But you can earn a sin. That's much easier. See? I don't like you. In what way, sweet boy? Not so... Perfect. You're also not still alive at the end of this episode, so Renera gets to one-up you twice in the next 56 minutes. These episodes are long. Princess Rhaenys, might we hope for news of Lord Corliss's recovery? Viserys is dead. Man, there's ripping off the band-aid and then there's being a dick. I'll let Cindy decide which side of that coin Princess Rhaenys falls on. But that war is not mine to begin. Well, you sure didn't look like someone who wanted to avoid war when your dragon ripped through the floor, killed hundreds of innocent civilians, and roared at the newly crowned king, but maybe I'm just oversensitive to little things like that. We should leave Dragonstone at once. And go where exactly? If the Greens have seized the throne, what safe haven exists for Rhaenyra, her kids, and their dragons? Unless you're offering an invitation for them to stay at Driftmark? Babe is coming. What babe? The babe with the power? What power? The power of voodoo? Hoodoo? You do? Do what? Remind me of the babe. We've done this five times before. Acting like that assessment matters a single f***ing dilated centimeter to the woman who's going into f***ing 
fucking labor. I don't think the current mango-sized object passing through her vagina gives a shit about the previous four. I'm grateful for your long service to the crown. So I'm presenting you with a choice. I wish we'd been shown the scene where Damon is discussing with the dragon how it'll be more dramatic if it doesn't show up until after he said the word choice. All the pregnancies in this show have unapologetically detailed the harsh toll birthing takes on the human body, but this one manages to weave together Rhaenyra's suffering and her dragon's simultaneous pain as part of their bond against a backdrop of uncaring men determined to continue their warmongering. See, House of the Dragon, you can be worthy of a sin removal. Uncle husbands who show up after the baby's already been delivered. Oh, it's him. You know, the um, guy who uh, did the thing. You know what? F it. I can't fake that this moment holds any meaning for me at all. All because the show decided to spend so much time on Sir Kristen Mopey McMopey face Cole instead of sowing the narrative seed of the bearded brothers. I don't know if this is deliberate or not, but this isn't nearly as moving as I think it's supposed to be. These people are swearing loyalty purely because of proximity. If they'd been in the crowd at King's Landing, they'd be bowing for Aegon. What's worse is that I'm certain the show knows this and yet still brings in the swelling music because it wants to have its you're the true king of Gondor moment. Okay, everyone, we're going to try something a little different uh, in the finale. Let's bring in the sweeping music and now stare into the middle distance. Middle distance, middle distance, middle distance. Keep staring, keep staring, keep staring. Middle distance, work it, work it, and cut to candles. Oh, this is going to blow people's minds. Okay, this table's pretty f***ing cool. In fact, it's so cool it makes me wonder why it wasn't used for the actual opening credits. Also, there could be books written on this franchise's obsession with maps. Although, I guess technically there already have been. Lady of the Seven Kingdoms and Protector of the Realm. She didn't bow her head. Make sure the audience sees that she didn't bow her head. That's important. Make sure they see it. Did they see it? Damon, none of our dragons have been to war. Uh, Karazis has been to war, right? Damon flew his dragon defeating the Crab Feeder, remember? Or did you forget about that like Daenerys sort of forgot about the Iron Fleet? There are also unclaimed dragons. Then there are the three wild dragons, all of whom nest here. Wait, there are unclaimed dragons up for grabs? How the f*** is that a thing? If they're so crucial to, well, basically everything, why isn't there a wacky race to f nab them, jab them, tab them, grab them, catch that dragon now? I also have a score of eggs incubating in the dragon mound. Yeah, but don't they take years to grow to a size that would be useful in an all-out dragon war? Okay, the war itself may go on for a while, but these dragons tend to get through cities in about half a disappointing finale amount of minutes, so I can't imagine it taking that long. Oh, <laughs> hell yeah, now we're gonna see some action. Well, this is just them talking. Oh, oh wait, there comes a dragon. <laughs> Yeah, and now she's getting off the dragon, and now we have more talking. What the f***, Kadi? I've been directed to deliver her message only to Princess Rhaenyra. Where is the princess? Sure, it's cool that Rhaenyra has such impossibly long-distance hearing. That way, she could wait for Otto to ask for her, and then she could launch on her dragon at exactly the right moment to create an epic entrance. Is this bridge just under constant f***ing repair? Like, why didn't they build this bridge wider or build a specific landing spot specifically designed for gratuitous Look at me! I've got a dragon! showboating? How did Rhaenyra even get off Cyrax? It's a pretty narrow bridge and her dragon takes up all of it. Did she climb down the back and crawl under the dragon? Or did she slide down the head? I would rather feed my sons to the dragons than have them carry shields and cups. I feel like that's a conversation the sons should at least have some say in. Every symbol of legitimacy belongs to him. Sure, but Aegon only has those symbols because you stole them for him, which nullifies the legitimacy part. If you robbed a bank, but also took all the receipts and paperwork with the cash and tried to pass them off as symbols of legitimacy, that eh, probably wouldn't hold up in court. And if it did, we certainly wouldn't be sending TV shows. We'd be legitimately robbing banks with a crew that had both George Clooney and Brad Pitt and neat heist music and... What were we talking about again? When dragons flew to war, everything burned. I do not wish to rule over a kingdom of ash and bone. And that's writer code for, yes, we know you'd love to see a war of the dragons, but that would be very expensive and something we'll likely say for a later season when we've run out of beloved characters to kill. The enemy have declared war. What are you going to do about it? Adult kids. Also, I know Damon plays the lovable rap scallion, but the way he's acting here is counterproductive, even for him. What good does it do to belittle Rhaenyra and risk her standing in the eyes of the very few lords she has at her side? A song of ice and fire. At this point, my chief reason for wanting George R. R. Martin to finish the books is so that when the characters look directly into the camera to read their titles, they'll have more variety to pull from. I've had men whipped for falling asleep on their watch. This show should be whipped for having one of its most interesting characters sidelined for the last handful of episodes. You are no man. Taking Eowyn's tagline in vain. Your brother is also dead. 
Man, Rhaenys is the absolute worst at delivering bad news. This is by far one of the least incestuous pairings, but it's still not entirely free of it. Damon's daughters are still engaged to his great nephew, so the sin here is that even when you don't think there's incest, there's probably still incest, no matter how strong these boys are. A total blockade of the shipping lanes. If there's one thing Star Wars Episode One taught me, it's that blockades of shipping lanes and trade disputes are guaranteed to make an exciting story. The Triarchy have been routed. The narrow sea is ours. Playing intense music and having Emma Darcy raise an eyebrow does not make the logistical gobbledygook that Lord Corliss is spitting out any more exciting. Dragons can fly faster than ravens. Well, scientifically speaking, I think that depends on a number of factors, the largest of which is whether the ravens are unladen. And don't even get me started on whether they're African or Euro- It's been said that as Targaryens, we are closer to gods than to men. Who said that? Could you please cite your source? Because that sounds fake as sh and you're hardly impartial. The Iron Throne puts us a touch closer, perhaps. Yeah, but that throne killed your father by giving him leprosy or tetanus or leprotinus or whatever. Sure, that'll put you closer to the gods, but not in the way you want and only by way of a funeral. I expect you will receive a very warm welcome. Jeez, Rhaenyra, do you want to jinx him anymore? Maybe have him say something like, I'll be right back. Or tell the audience he just has a few days left until retirement from the Force. Where's the bloody maester? Why did you wait until now to ask for the maester? You saw a written message being handed to you, then you took another couple seconds as if trying to recall whether you could read it. Come on, Boros, keep your head in the game. This is the kind of attention span that gets Baratheons killed during hunting trips. I want you to put out your eye. Cool effect, but did he scoop out his own damaged eye and replace it with a blue gemstone? If so, why wear the eye patch if he's got a badass replacement eye? Is it because he didn't want to go to the Lannisters to extend the CGI budget? Is it? Take Prince Lucerus back to his dragon. Now. Phew, close call keeping the peace there. Now I'm sure he'll hold Prince Aemon for a little while to prevent any further violence, right? Right? Kicking a child out to fly home in a thunderstorm. Not only a child, but a prince. This is the worst thing I've seen a Baratheon do to a child since... Actually, scratch that. I forgot about the Stannis Shireen thing. Now I'm just extra sad. So here are two sins for Baratheons being awful to children. This entire climax is amazing. From the shots of Vagar slowly stalking Arax in the storm to their desperate chase. It's the perfect way to end the season with a promise of more dragon fighting action to come in season two. Also, Game of Thrones property decides to make the most exciting sequence in an episode barely visible. Cliché. Smart! Way to use the train and your dragon's smaller size to your advantage. Now I'm sure Lucerus will find a spot to land and hide in this tight canyon where Fagar can't get him. Right? Right? I'm not sure what's more sinful here, the fact that Amon is using this scenario to try and take an eye from Lucerus, or that he's under the impression Lucerus can hear anything he's saying. <laughs> Amon has the perfect eye f up face, but seriously, he had to know this was a possibility, right? How else was he expecting to take them out of the sky? Wait, why are you looking at me like that? Eamon's the one that got your son killed, not me. Oh, f it was the strong joke I said earlier, wasn't it? Well, the bridge that was our friendship appears to have been trampled by a contrivance dragon, so I may as well tell you, you're getting 20 extra sins for this season ends with the main character breaking the fourth wall cliche. Golly, does this show love staring? We have to go back. Mortal Kombat! Well, here you are, surrounded by attendants, all focused on the babe. Babe. Babe with the power. <laughs> An astute observation <laughs> has led to laughter. <laughs> we are laughing. has begun her labors. Do you mind? I've gone here a word he's saying. Don't you do you mind me? I was talking to my husband. Well, can not talk to him somewhere else? I've gone here a bloody thing. Yeah, there were horses and a man on fire, and I killed a guy with a trident. <laughs> At this time, a friend shall lose his friend's hammer, and the young shall not know where lie the things possessed by their fathers that their fathers put there only just the night before. 
This knight will protect you as well. You should choose. I choose rich every fucking time. I waited so long, and you broke it. What do I say? Whatever you wish. Fantasia can arise in you. Talking to people all day long, blah, blah, blah. Bullshit. Could you pass the salt? I would give you many children of pure Valerian blood so that we might strengthen the royal line and the realm. What have I done? If you mean to elicit some anger from me, you should know that you're failing, princess. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Oh, come on. We can take him. You're a naughty, naughty princess. Your eyes, your grace. All the better to see you with, my dear. Perhaps the princess might like to hear something else. She would not play it again. <clears throat> Toss a coin to your witcher, oh valley of plenty. Well, isn't this splendid? Tiny box, huge room inside. What's that about? Let me explain. It is tradition, your grace. It's tradition. I may run from hyenas, but I will always fight a bully! Firstly, what about the R.O.U.S.'s? Rodents of unusual size? I don't think they exist. <laughs> as vivid as these flames I saw it. A male babe. Born to me. What babe? Babe with the power. Craven. Nobody calls me chicken needles. Nobody! Take a man! <laughs> Round for king. Here, tell these people something they don't know about me. Brothers don't shake hands. Brothers gotta hug. I'm the map. 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 Stop. Collaborate and listen. Tommy. That's uh, a fake thing. I took great care in its preparation. I'm sorry, what is that? The holy hand grenade of Antioch! I'm not dead! Your father was a good man. You are a sad, strange little man. I know this union is not what you would choose. No, I'd rather French kiss a skunk. I prefer roast duck to goose. And I've been known to sample the occasional rosé. And a couple summers back, I tried a Merlot that used to be a Chardonnay, oh. which got a bit complicated. Okay. The leechings have always brought his grace relief. I've never had anything you doctors didn't try to cure with leeches. A leech on my ear for earache, a leech on my bottom for constipation. Will I be remembered as a good king, Lionel? How about new? <laughs> you know better than anyone, it was no accident. Diplomatic community. I am you! We chose an egg for the baby. You did it. You got the egg. They're savages. They eat every third baby because they think it makes fruit grow bigger! Was it your plot? I know of no reason why the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. The tenants would pay their tributes annually to their new Targaryen lord. You undercook fish, believe it or not, jail. You overcook chicken, also jail. Ah! I will die! Wait, I have an idea. Call a locksmith! Call a locksmith! Paris, I did not wish for this. This seems like a good time for a drink and a cold, calculated speech with sinister overtones. What's your story, Slats? Why are you made out of wood? Oh, Sonio, Silon, Miskas. Aexios on you, Elon misses. Well, peeing in the ocean was my bucket list item. Is this art or a mistake? <gasps> my prince, my prince, let me see. <gasps> yeah, yeah, and I passed with him. Fix him up real nice. Who spoke these lies to you? It was Agon. What? Where do you think you're going? I'm sorry, who the f are you? I'm the one who kills the queen. The mouth. Mouth. Oh, God, she, she knew that. Why am I so stupid? Who goes there? I am Archer, emissary of the Gorgonites. <laughs> oh. <sighs> oh. 
Oh, there's just like the faintest sous-son of like uh, asparagus and there's a just a flutter of like a like a nutty Edom cheese. I don't give a shit about tawnies. You wait till my father hears about this. This is servant stuff. I'll make you an offer. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. Brothers don't shake hands. Brothers got a hug. Sometimes you think you have true love and then you catch the early flight home from San Diego and a couple of nude people jump out of your bathroom blindfolded like a goddamn magic show ready to double team your girlfriend. Plot or no, the king changed his mind. You are being a cheer tater, Torrance, and a pain in my ass. No kicks. We thought to inquire here as to his whereabouts. And describe him. He's my best friend, he's my pal. He's my homeboy, my rotten soldier. He's my sweet cheese, my good time boy. Anyone else? Anyone? Anyone? Are you smoking weed? As you wish. That day she was amazed to discover that when he was saying as you wish, what he meant was, I love you. He whispered his final wish that his firstborn son, Aegon, should fuck off. Give me the power I beg of you. The High Septon crowned Aegon in the Dragon Pit. I witnessed it myself just before I fled on Melis. Things that could have been brought to my attention yesterday! And he chose me as his successor to defend the realm, not cast it headlong into war. But I was going into Tashi Station to pick up some power converters. Where is Damon? He's at home! Who was in his tights? I came as a messenger, not a warrior. Look what you did, you little jerk! Cookie! Nom 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 nom